Uh, you're gonna... Okay, so we're going to break bread thinking about Exodus chapter five, Israel suffering in Egypt, no, no bread, uh, sorry, no, no straw. Um, and yet they're still going to make the same number of bricks and Moses getting all depressed uh, and feeling that he can't do his ministry, etc. But of course, this is all to lead us to the Lord Jesus, because we are here to break bread in his memory, not just to have a Bible study on Exodus. So let's, uh, let's start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you with all our issues, with all that are, is in our heart. And Father, above all, we want to be like your son. We pray that you will grant us of his spirit, that truly we might know him and make him known, and that he might be all for us. So, Father, pour out your spirit, his spirit, into our hearts, whereby we might cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help all of us who have given prayer requests this day, that we might be better witnesses. We pray that you will give us meetings with people whom we can somehow win for your cause, for your kingdom and for your dear son. Only you can, can do that. Only you can lead us. And we pray that we might be willing tools in your hand. Please give us those meetings, Father, so that we might make an eternal difference in the lives of others. We pray for wisdom. We pray, Father, that your word might be made flesh in us as it was in the Lord Jesus. And we ask that as we are each prepared for the eternity ahead, you will help us in the specific issues that we all face. We pray, Father, for Harshit with his mouth ulcers. We, we pray for Phil's daughter, and especially that she will come to Jesus through her cancer. And we think, Father, of all those going through specific issues at this time. We pray that you'll be with each and every one of us. And we pray particularly for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and in Russia, and all those bordering on those lands in, in Latvia, we think of our loved ones in Latvia in particular. We pray for Aya with her collapsed roof and her collapsed ceiling all around her. And we pray that you will be with her and the your blessed Cindy and I as we try to minister your love and grace in, in Latvia and Ukraine this, and Israel in the week or so that is coming. Father, we pray also for the forgiveness of our sins. As we think of the Lord Jesus, we see how far short we have really come. And we pray that you will stir us up and that you will pour your spirit into us and that we will not be discouraged by failure, but that we might look ahead and that we might really see that the best is ahead and that we may practice total surrender to you. We Pray, Father, for those near and dear to us. We think of Jackie's mum and dad at 94 years old with housing issues. We do pray that you'll be with that situation and that you will bless Ariella also with her health issues and that you will bring us all through, above all things, into your kingdom. And open our eyes now, Father, to these ancient records that we're reading in Exodus, that these things might live in our hearts for the sake of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So Exodus uh, chapter five. <clears throat> well, I've said that Moses is not quite uh, as he as he might have been or as he, he should have been. But that's just you and me. He's very <laughs> resistant to the call that you can make a difference. You, Moses, you who are 40 years in the luxury of Egypt and were then 40 years, it seems, having had a breakdown looking after your father-in-law's sheep, not a great life, looking after your father-in-law's animals for 40 years, and you married, you know, one of his, one of his seven daughters, uh, so on and so forth. And I want you, God says to Moses, oh no, I, I, I can't do it, I, I'm 80 years old. No, no, you're the one. And so the story goes on, verse 1, afterward Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, this is what Yahweh the God of Israel says, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Moses and Aaron come and talk to Pharaoh. And as the record goes on, it's clear that it's actually Moses talking to Pharaoh. But in Exodus chapter 3, I'll just read you from verse 18 there. You shall come, you and the elders of Israel, 
to the king of Egypt, and you shall tell him, let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God. So the idea was the elders were to go, and they were all to go together, but the elders didn't pitch, they didn't come. And Aaron was supposed to really be the guy doing the talking, but it seems that actually he didn't. And so there you are. <laughs> you, you looked for other people in the body of believers that they should be with me and that they should, you know, be there with me and hold my hand and be with me. And very often it doesn't happen. You look at the life of Paul, you look at all those who serve God. There are so many times when you are disappointed by your fellow believers who are supposed to be with you, and it's you. Someone has to be the Christian around here, and it looks like it has to be me. Now, when you're on your own, you, you think, oh, wouldn't it be great to be with, you know, surrounded by dynamic people, surrounded by a functional church? Wouldn't it just be great? Yes, it would be, and yes, it can be great when you find something of that. But in the end, God wants you. And the Lord Jesus wants you. And so there inevitably will be these experiences where all the rest of them fall away and you are left alone with God and Jesus. Well, I've been reading Exodus all my life from a, or having it read to me from a, a child. And I always read it as this, let my people go. I, I, I read it as God saying to Pharaoh, let my people go, let them leave. Let them leave Egypt and go to Canaan. But reading Exodus through several times this week, I, I saw that that's not at all what was being said. God was not saying to Pharaoh at this point, let my people go, as in let them leave Egypt and let them go to Canaan. He was asking him something very specific. Let my people go, verse 1, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Time and again, this is said. When it says in other places, let my people go that they may serve me, the service that was in view was a one-time act. Let my people go that they may sacrifice. Let my people go that they may keep a feast to me. Let my people go that they may serve me. The service was specifically to keep a feast. And that's why you read about the Passover as a service. What do you mean by this service? The children were to ask and they were to be told. So the, the requirement, the, the request of Pharaoh was, let God's people go that they may hold a feast. Not let them go so that they might, uh, I don't know, some sort of come back. Uh, sorry, that they might just go permanently, but so that they might simply hold a feast and, and come back to, to Egypt. And Pharaoh refuses that. Well, as you probably know, there's been a huge amount of archaeological discovery in Egypt. And they have discovered, yes, bricks made of straw, bricks without straw. They've discovered all the records kept of how, yes, there were taskmasters, yes, there were foremen, and how there was an exact number of bricks that were to be produced by each slave and each group of slaves. Yep. And they've also found that although the Egyptians kept a daily record of how many bricks their slaves made, there was always an allowance made that, well, slaves can't work every day because they need a few days off now and again to worship their gods. They found that, that, yeah, you've got to let slaves off every now and again to worship their god. So you see, when Pharaoh, Pharaoh is asked by Moses, let God's people, let Yahweh's people go and have three days off to worship him. That was quite normal. That was quite normal. But it, Pharaoh says no. And it gets to such a pitch with all the plagues that come to try to soften his heart, and he's hardening his heart, when eventually Pharaoh and the Egyptians say of their own volition to the Israelites, get out of our country. 
This is after the, the firstborn are killed. Do you want gold? Do you want our diamonds? Do you want our gold, our silver, our precious things? Take it and go. Get out of here. That was not what God asked of them. God simply said, let my people go and have three days off to worship me in the wilderness. Let them go that they may serve me. That is to observe a feast to me in the wilderness. That's why at one point Moses is going to say to Pharaoh, well, we've got to take all our animals with us because we don't know what our God will ask us to serve him with. They, uh, let my people go that they may serve me means that they might sacrifice to me. Let my people go that they may sacrifice to me in the wilderness. Let my people go that they may serve me. That is to hold a feast. That's the idea. And I, I see the beauty of how God works, that he is not a manipulator. Man is not a puppet that is simply manipulated uh, around the place. No, God respects human free will. And you, but you see how he does it in a very beautiful way. Let my people have three days off that they might do their religious service to me. You let other slaves go and have a few days off to uh, do their religious thing. Let my people do that. No, we're not going to let them do that. Ten plagues, bang, bang, bang. No, we're not going to let you go and worship your God for three days. Bang, bang, bang. Then there's a death of the firstborn. Get out, please, Israel. You Hebrews, get out. I find that, I just find that very beautiful, that God didn't force the Egyptians. They themselves asked the Israelites to leave them. Yeah, it's God is not a manipulator, but he sets up situations. Now, we are those who are following the spirit, right? And we are treated likewise. God will not force you nor anybody against their will, but he is eager to be involved with us in our lives. And he will set up situations so that, so that we can go the way that he wants us to go. Well, verse two, Pharaoh said, who is Yahweh that I should listen to his voice? I don't recognize Yahweh. Well, again, these archaeologists have found that in some of the pyramids where the pharaohs were buried, they were buried with, a, with their favorite sort of credo on, on the head or on the entrance to the, uh, to the vault where the body was. And it said, translated, I am that which was, that which is, and that which shall be. Well, that is the meaning of Yahweh. I was, I am, and I will be. So the pharaohs were playing God. He's saying, Pharaoh's saying, I'm Yahweh. And you see, this is how the world is around us. We will be who we will be. And God is saying, I am Yahweh. I will be who I will be. And I will save my people. As I said last week, the simple meaning of this Yahweh name is, I will save. I will save you. And that comes to full term in Yahoshua. I will save. Yahweh saves. Yahoshua, what in Greek is Jesus. Yahoshua, God saves. Then verse three, you have a strange thing. Moses and Aaron say, look, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to Yahweh our God, lest he fall on us with plague or with the sword. Is God so kind of like capricious as to say to the Israelites, if you don't go three days in the wilderness and sacrifice to me, I'm going to kill you. I don't think that's what he's saying. Who is the us? Let us go, that's Israel, three days into the wilderness and sacrifice, lest he fall on us with plague or with the sword. I think the us, this is Moses talking to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He's saying, look, all of us. You know, if you let us do this, you will be spared the sword, but they don't. Well, God was seeking even the salvation of Pharaoh and of the Egyptians. Well, no, he says, Pharaoh says, verse four, get back to your burdens. Why do you make the people rest? 
from their burdens, verse five, it's the word Shabbat. Why are you trying to you know, have a Sabbath from your, from your work? And Pharaoh says, verse five, behold, the people of the land are now many. You think like Pharaoh, you and your forefathers were the very ones who said all the Hebrew boys must be killed because the people are getting so many. They must be drowned in the river Nile. Any baby Hebrew boy must be killed, but you can't stop them, can you? Pharaoh, listen to yourself. Behold, the people of the land are now many. Yeah, and you tried to exterminate all their baby boys and you didn't get anywhere, did you? You were up against God. Humble yourself. Surrender. If a, you know, this is the classic case study, isn't it? Of if a man will not totally surrender, you're going to end up in the mess that Pharaoh ended up in, in that absolute misery. So he gives them this thing. Um, you, we're not going to give you any straw, but you've got to make the same number of bricks. And look at the words used, verse 11. Nothing of your work will be diminished. Israel have been the slaves of Pharaoh, but God wants them to be his slaves. There was a change of masters when they crossed the Red Sea. And crossing the Red Sea is like baptism. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 10, that they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The cloud of water on top of them. Cloud is just water, water both sides of them. So when they crossed the Red Sea, they changed masters. And of course, Romans 6 talks about that, that when we're baptized, we are no longer slaves of sin or Egypt. We are slaves of, of the Lord Jesus. So when they were slaves of Egypt, they were told, you will not diminish anything from the commandment. The same words are used in Deuteronomy where God says to his people, don't diminish. Don't diminish from obeying my commandments from doing my work. And again, verse 13, the taskmasters were urgent saying, fulfill your work quota daily. Well, that work quota daily, the daily work quota. Again, the same words in Hebrew are used later on in the law in Leviticus 23 about the daily work of the tabernacle. So they were slaves to Pharaoh, and God is saying, let my people go. They're going to be my slaves now. And, you know, when we're baptized, that's what happens. You change masters. But we all want to be totally free, don't we? We naturally want to be free to do what I want to do, to feel how I want to feel, to, to, to live how I want to live, to just carry on how I want to carry on. And you see it in advertising, buy this car and you've got the highway open before you. You can, you're free to go where you want. Buy into this pension plan or this investment plan and you will get financial freedom and you'll be able to sit on the beach. And man is asking the right questions, but looking in the wrong places for the answers. Man is saying, I want to, to, to be free. Yeah. But if you think that freedom means freedom to do what you want, no, that's not freedom. That is slavery to sin. You want to be free to what, drink as much alcohol as you want, do as many drugs as you want? You'll become addicted. That's not freedom. And so we are being shown here that we've only changed masters. I say only. We are no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer in Egypt. We are now the slaves of Jesus. But Paul in Romans 8 says that all creation groans, waiting for the glorious liberty of God's dear children. The glorious liberty of God's dear children. So the ultimate freedom is ahead. Not now, it is ahead then we will be ultimately free. We will not be forced in any way. We will be radically free. We talk about how wonderful it's going to be to be saved and to have eternal life and to be in the kingdom of God. But it's not just the eternity of the life. It is the quality and the nature of the life. I mean, if eternal life means driving around the streets of the suburbs of South London for, for 
you know, 20 zillion years. <laughs> no thanks. You know, no, we don't want life. You know, if God's offering me eternal life. Well, before I say yes to it, I want to know what that life's going to be like. You know? And yes, the offer is there and it is wonderful that we are offered eternity of a, the highest possible nature, ultimate freedom, absolute freedom, that finally no ties that bind, no tram line that is, that is forcing you this way or that way or, or whatever. That is part of the gospel of the kingdom, the ultimate freedom of God's dear children. And as again we read in the New Testament, now we have just been given some talents to look after that do not belong to us. But as the Lord says, if you are not faithful in that which is another man's, that's his, then how can you be given that which is your very own? In other words, in the kingdom, we will have what is my very own. We will be radically independent, radically free, on the highest possible level. So, verse 15, the foremen, the officers of the Israelites, came and cried to Pharaoh, saying, why do you deal this way with your servants? The only other time you read about people crying to Pharaoh is when the Egyptians cried to Pharaoh in Joseph's time, when there was the, the famine, the seven years of famine. So they were acting like Egyptians. They thought that Pharaoh was the one to cry to. And should they not have cried out to God? Well, they cried to Pharaoh to, to, to save them from this situation. And yet, later on, we are told they cried to Yahweh. Moses says, Deuteronomy, we cried to Yahweh, the God of our fathers, and Yahweh heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. Well, back in Exodus 2, we're told the children of Israel groaned because of their bondage, and they cried out. Who did they cry out to? They cried out to Pharaoh. That's what we have just read here. They cried to Pharaoh. They cried out. But their cry came up to God because of their bondage. In other words, yeah, they cried out to Pharaoh, but God heard it as if they were crying to him. And that gives you a window onto what prayer is all about. That prayer is not simply a set of words that you say to God, because frankly, some people are better at verbalizing than others. People say to me, I don't know how to pray. Well, and I say, don't worry, because it's not all about words. God sees your situation as your prayer. As again, later on in the law, there is an example where the law says that if, you, if you're poor and you give your jacket as a pledge, well, that must be returned to you every night, lest the man feel cold and cry out to God. And God hears that cry and judges the person who, who's keeping the guy's jacket overnight. So someone cries out, oh, I'm so cold. God hears that as a cry to him. And this is great comfort and a great challenge that our whole lives are in that sense a, a cry out to, to God. Well, everything seems to go wrong, doesn't it, in this chapter, that Moses has, 40 years before, tried to save Israel. That didn't work. He ran away into the wilderness, stayed there for 40 years, looking after his father-in-law's sheep or animals. Not a great life. Now he comes back to try to save his people, and they don't want to know. And, in fact... His involvement has made things worse because Pharaoh says, no, you, you're just trying to get these people of Israel uh, time off work. So, OK, we're going to whip you. We're going to beat you so that you produce the same number of bricks, although we're not going to give you any straw. And so the 
foremen, the elders of Israel, come to Moses and say to him, verse 21, may Yahweh look at you and judge. You've made us a stench to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh. You've put a sword in their hand to kill us. Like, get out, Moses, you just messed us up. You've made things so much worse. And Moses goes back to God and says, why did you send them? So everything has gone wrong. They've appealed to Pharaoh to try to appeal to his conscience. No, that didn't work. So it seems the whole thing has gone seriously wrong. But this is, and then Moses comes to God and basically says, look, give up with me, get off me. It's not working. You've said, I will, I will, I will, seven times. I will say, I will deliver. I will bring my people out of Israel. But you're not doing it. Out of Egypt. But you're not doing it. Well, what's God's response? You see, God could have said, well, okay, if at least Israel plus Moses had even a modicum of sort of politeness in the way they spoke to me, if they had a bit of faith, well, I would save them. But look, they're hopeless. They just, they just don't want to know, do they? So I won't save them. What does he say? Go to chapter 6, verse 1. Yahweh said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. By a strong hand, he will let them go. By a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. I am Yahweh, which means I will be. I will do it. My point is verse 1 now okay now now that you are at rock bottom now that you're angry with me now that you think that i am not going to come through now that you think that actually you've put a sword in the hand of the egyptians to kill you all now i'll do it now i'll do it and this is what happens that there has to be failure including spiritual failure in order to bring us to the point when, okay, now I will save you. By grace, now you're ready. There has to be failure, personal moral failure, the failure of the project in order for it to happen. Now, I know that, that some of you have been over in Riga in the many years that we lived there running the uh, soup kitchen and people thought, wow, you know, how have you got this church of, you know, hundreds of people baptized? Where did that come from? Well, it started in our front room in our apartment in, uh, in Riga. But um, when we got too big for our front room, we moved into a basement, uh, a, uh, well, like a hall uh, in a basement. It cost quite a lot of money. And yeah, we were getting 20 people coming to our apartment and I, we couldn't fit them all in. So we moved into this hall, a great expense. And the first night, two people turned up and they left soon afterwards. And I paced that hall from one end to the other, blue tiles there were on the floor, thinking this is what a failure. People will maybe come around to our house, but to our flat, but they won't come to a hall. And then it picked up again. Oh, yes, then we were getting up to 50, 60 people. We couldn't fit 50 or 60 people in that hall. So we got a bigger hall, the one that most of you would have uh, known, the, uh, the big one. Again, moved in there. Everyone said they were going to come. Nobody came. And that hall was long long and narrow and it had a red carpet on it and i remember the first night no virtually nobody came and then i was having put savings we had personally and other people had donated into getting that hall and i thought oh what a what a white elephant we're left with just you know just this is just useless and i paced that hall up and down up and down what have i done well, and then it picked up. There has to be that failure. And, you know, we shouldn't sin. And I'm not justifying sin. But it is through your own sinfulness. It is when you come right down. You say, look, who am I? As Moses said, why do you call me? I'm not the man. But now, this is the force of chapter 6, verse 1. Now, God says to Moses, now I will do it. When you are at rock bottom, now. Yeah, you're right. You're there. Okay, right. You got there. Moses, okay, now. 
Now we'll do it. Now I'll do it for you. Now I'll come through for you. This is the myth of the idea of the, uh, the triumphant Christian life, where you know people give the, the image they present as having an awesome spiritual experience, that every day is glorious victory, glorious triumph, every day. I oh, know, victory to victory, glory to glory, triumph to triumph. That is not the way it goes. Look at Moses. Look at how God saved his people from Egypt and brought them to Israel, to Canaan. This was through failure on their part, on the part of Moses, all the way through, on the part of Aaron, all the way through. So that Moses just feels, oh, why? Why on earth did you do this? It is through you know, the magnificent defeat, as I often say. Yeah, you think of the Lord on the cross, and we're here to, to remember. This was the magnificent defeat. You know, a man naked, covered in blood and spittle, come down from the cross. Huh, he can't come down. He saved others. He cannot save himself. You can't get out of the power of Rome, everyone was thinking. But it was through that. You know, is he going to... Revive before he dies? No. Is he dead? Yeah, he's a goner. He's gone. Okay, Roman soldier comes, spear in the side, blood and water flows out. Is he pronounced dead? He is pronounced dead. But the magnificent defeat. Absolutely. But there's another reason, I think, why we have this picture of Israel and the and the bricks and being whipped and beaten and come on, produce the same quota of bricks and we're not giving you any straw. Whip, beat, beat, whip. It's a cameo. It's a small typical picture of their experience in Egypt. I mean, I'm sure the women were raped. I am sure that there were people killed. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, no doubt. But this is the cameo that God gives us here. In other words, just to show us how awful their lives were. But then very soon afterwards in Exodus chapter 16, just they get the other side of the Red Sea. They say, oh, we want to go back to Egypt. It was good there. Chapter 17, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us? Numbers 11, oh, we remember the flesh pots by which we sat and ate really nice meat in Egypt, and there were the cucumbers, and there was the garlic, and there were fish. Oh, life was so much better back in Egypt. And we're given this little cameo to say life was a concentration camp existence for the Hebrews. And you see there the truth of what you read in Ecclesiastes, do not say the former days are better than these. There is a very strong tendency in all of us, in all human beings, to think the past was better. When I was a kid, when I was a young person, life was, life was good. Now, nah, life's not so good now. I've got this, I've got that. And the future, well, is not actually good at all because I'm getting on now. And uh, I have not made it in life as I thought I might do or dreamt I might do. I have not quite made it. And I suppose I shall cough and hack my way on for a few more years until the inevitable happens and my number comes up and I shall die. That is how most people are. And that is why as we get older, just in a secular sense, people get very frustrated. They cuss under their breath. They're frustrated that this doesn't work or that doesn't work or I didn't do that right or she didn't do that right. They didn't do that right. Oh, how do I do this? Oh, this phone again. Oh. This doesn't work, oh, no, that doesn't work. And people live their lives endlessly frustrated. And it was better when I was younger. No, that's how it is in the world. But that's like Israel thinking that life was better in Egypt. Actually, it was great in Egypt. And you see how selective is human memory. They remembered the fish they ate a few times, probably. They remember. They remember the garlics, but they didn't want to remember being whipped and beaten to make more bricks. No way to make enough bricks to, to meet the daily quota. Right, I shall beat you. 
They didn't want to remember that. And that is why human history is a bit of a myth. All history is interpretation. It may sound a philosophical point, but it is so. Uh, history is interpretation, really. Focusing on certain things and not the entire picture. Only God is the true historian. And human beings, are we're all very selective in our memory of the past. And we tend to glorify the past. The past was better. Well, as you see, in Christ, the past was Egypt. The past of our lives was awful. It was concentration camp existence. It was Egypt. Now is far better. I'm free from all that. And my future is glorious. I've got eternity in front of me. And this is what makes old age or facing death so different for us, that the best is ahead. And this is where the gospel is almost too good news to believe, that the best is ahead. I will be saved. I will, by God's great grace, live forever. I will live forever. And not just live in the sense of exist, but with this glorious freedom, the glorious liberty of God's dear children that awaits me. Ephesians says that God will lavish upon us the riches of his goodness throughout the ages of eternity. This is what is ahead. The best is undoubtedly ahead. It really is ahead. And this is what's guaranteed by the Lord's death. That he died as the guarantee to try and get us to see it, that the, we will be saved for sure. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. That we definitely might have hope, elpis, which means a certainty, not a hope for the best, but the absolute certainty that I will be saved. Now, I am not just trying to tap you under the chin in the difficult lives that you all have, that we all have, and say, oh, look, you know, look, look on the bright side. All right, this is not look on the bright side. I'm talking absolute, ultimate reality. That the best is ahead. It really is. And today, our life is so far better spiritually than the past. The past was <clears throat> chaotic, random, whatever. Things are much better. These are better days. These are far better days than when we were not in Christ or when we were fumbling our way through life, sort of with him, sort of not. Now, life, <laughs> these are better days. And the, the best is ahead, both in this life and above all in the life that is to go on forever and ever and ever and ever, like a long, long line with no end. In chapter six, we're going to read that Israel did not listen to Moses because of, in the Hebrew, narrowness of spirit. Their spirit was narrowed. But in the Bible, ruach, that's this Hebrew word, spirit, it, it's got a wide range of meaning, but one aspect of it is mind. What do you think? They did not listen, chapter 6 says, Exodus 6, because of narrowness of spirit, narrowness of mind. They were narrow-minded. All they saw was what was in front of them. That was the whole horizon that they had. And that's how it is for a lot of people today. Clever people, stupid people, rich people, poor people, fat people, thin people. Yeah? All they see is what's right in front of them, what's right in front of their face. Oh, that feels good, so I want it again. Oh, that didn't feel nice, so I don't want it. Oh, I'd love that. Oh, I'd like that car. Oh, I'd like that man. Oh, I'd like that woman. Oh, I'd like that house. Oh, I'd like that holiday that I see advertised in you know, some exotic place. Huh. That's being narrow-minded. In Christ, knowing his death for me, his love for me, his body for me, his, his blood for me. 
you are no longer narrow-minded. You've got the ultimate breadth of vision to see beyond what is now to that which is eternal. We do not look at the things that are seen, but at the things which are unseen. So Corinthians, Paul says, because the things that are seen are temporal. They only last for a bit, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So this is all, because, all, all possible because of him. As we started off with our, our song, Knowing You, Jesus. This is what it's all about. It's all about him. It's not about me. It's all about him. Now, you come then to, to face the ultimate reality. Is this true for me or not? And it is. This is one reason why Jesus died in the public way that he did on the cross to, as it were, flag our attention, to get our attention, to show us that, yes, God's promises are for real, and you and me really will live forever. The best is ahead. Do not look at Egypt, at the world, as if it's all great and hunky-dory, and, oh, wasn't it cool uh, when I was younger, when I didn't have all this stuff? No. Actually, that was not freedom. That was slavery. As I say, what do you want? You want to be free to do whatever you want? No. Because if you do whatever you want, you will end up a slave. <laughs> it's just, uh, alcohol and drugs are the obvious example. You do as much alcohol and drugs as you want, and what will, you, what will happen? You become addicted. There's no freedom there. Um, but it's true in, in all sorts of other ways, less obvious maybe than those than substance abuse. But you just do what you want think what you want, how you want, you are not free. The path that God has given us is to ultimate freedom because he knows that's what we want. He knows that's what we want. And he gives us the path there through service to him now. So yeah, it's a change of masters. It's a change of masters. <laughs> so that we might come. To the ultimate freedom, or as Paul says, the glorious liberty of God's dear children. Well, quite rightly, we forget. <clears throat> Sorry, quite rightly, we, we remember. We, we remember what he has done. So let's give thanks uh, for the, the bread, which is the symbol of the body of Jesus. Um, <clears throat> I wonder, um, Brian, would you like to pray for the bread? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you now to remember the body, the broken body of our wonderful Lord and King, Jesus. We can imagine ourselves see, seated at the end of that table as Jesus passes that bread, that broken piece, along to each of our, our brothers of long ago and finally come to us. Father, we thank you for this bread. We thank you for this, such a simple yet wonderful way that we can always remember our Lord Jesus, what he has done for us, what he is doing for us now, what he will do for us to which we look gratefully forward to his coming back to, the, to create your kingdom on earth, that we might serve you in whatever capacity you deign for us. Father, we thank you for this symbol, the broken body of our Lord Jesus. We thank you for this bread. In his name, amen. So we take the bread, we break the bread, we take part of it as the symbol of his love for us. You know, this is the wonderful truth that someone, the Son of God, died for me. 
the just for the unjust, that I might come to God. Um, Brother Joseph, would, would you like to give thanks for the, for the cup? This is, you know, the communion, the, the fellowship of the blood of Christ. Uh, Joseph, yes. would you like? Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, let's pray. Our God and our Father, we give you glory and honor and your glory and thank you so much for this time that, Lord, you gave us to listen, to hear your word. And Father, probably up until our daily life, thank you so much for this time of wine. That, Father, we keep, uh, we drink this cup in remembrance of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, Father, was sprinkled unto us for the forgiveness of our sins. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, may we partake this cup in the mighty name of our lord jesus christ amen amen this is the communion of the blood of christ well let's uh, conclude with uh, with a prayer um uh, Brenda, would you like to pray for us if the children are quiet, or even if they're not, actually? That doesn't come into it, really. Would you like to pray for us, uh, Brenda? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your precious gift of life. Thank you for this day that we could be alive and come together fellowship and meditate on your word. Father, there's nothing we can do without you in Jesus. Absolutely nothing. And I pray that you give us the understanding and the wisdom to abide in Jesus so that we can bear fruit. That is your will, Father. Let us do your will like Jesus did. I pray for your blessings over each and every person and their household, Father, for us to be the light of this world. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Well, any, anyone else who would like to pray, they're also uh, very welcome. Jackie, would you like to pray something? Or anybody, actually, is welcome. Yeah, I'll, I'll pray. Um, I really thank you um, that you have saved us, that we've been able to see and hear your words and take them into our hearts. I thank you for the fellowship that is here among these people, people who, you know, we, we live in different countries and different parts of the world, but yet we're connected by you. And each person has asked for a prayer for somebody they love or for the situation. But we understand today that sometimes we are in this world, we are going to go through challenges and tribulations. And it's through those tribulations and trials that we come closer to you, that we find our faith. May we find our faith, may we be strong in our faith, and may we walk in the in the faith and may we share our love with others and as Duncan goes to do good work to show the love of God by actions not just by words may you go with him and may you touch every heart of every person that is on this fellowship today but not just their hearts the people around us and help us teach us to walk in your way amen 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 all right um ariella you you wanted to make um a little personal testimony understand so um i don't i've got no idea what you're going to say but would you like to um would you like to do that now Yes. Um, what it was I that I, first of all, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity. I might uh, still give a longer or further testimony on my YouTube, but I thought it'd be easier 
since uh, you go on here anyways. Um, for those that don't know, and by the way, earlier went, so Candace is my birth name, legal name, but I changed it in 2016 to Ariella because I looked at the meaning. I've gone through, long story short, I've gone through many chronic health issues since I was 15 years old. And Ariella is the, um, if you look up in the baby book or name meaning, it's the female version of Ariel, which means lioness of God or lioness of Yahweh and lions give strength. So that's why I use Ariella now. Um, I just can't afford to legally change it over. So I just didn't want any confusion. But going with that, I must have uh, met Duncan and the Caroline Ministries back in 2014 somewhere around there 2015 and my testimony is uh, first of all I'm thankful for this group because because I know that uh I'm trying to say that without it sounding boastful at all that Duncan does have a lot of knowledge he looking up the scriptures I um have the New Testament books that he uh that that I bought just all the all the uh, years that he spent looking up I just know that God has helped you um you know form these lessons and I'm thankful to you know to learn from you and you know with you and with everybody else to do in this so my testimony is it actually has reading the scriptures I you know um and just keep getting the deep uh, lessons learning from them has helped me become a better student and to follow Christ and also the book of the you know the real Christ you know I, I haven't uh, coming from the mainstream up to you know what I'm learning today you know about like the that Christ has not pre-existed it's taken me a lot of years to shed off that old way and to come to actually know who Christ is. So I'm just, just want to share my testimony that I'm thankful for the journey I've been on. It's not over yet. It's still going. Even though I stumbled and falled many times, I got back up and I know that Jesus is helping me along the way. So I just wanted to um, share the testimony that uh, your Bible basic books as well has helped me and my husband out. And my husband was baptized. I shared that. But back in 2016, um, since we're isolated, he got baptized at, at home. But through those lessons, he has helped come to the truth as well. So that that's my testimony is if you keep plugging away at the scriptures and keep plugging away at the studies that are get, given, and um, it's not an easy road. And that's what I like about it, the studying. And there's actually... You know, like with the daily Bible readings, with the notes and everything, everything we look up, we, we're still learning. So I just wanted to share the testimony that okay, to, it's, it's, it's not a rush, but I just wanted to say, you know, just say that God has been with me through, you know, um, all this way. And I just wanted to inspire other people sharing that God is with you too, even if you feel um, maybe you have walked off the path or stumbled or you know trying to get back on and um, so ne never give up and again just go to the scriptures as the book of Acts says you know to search and study the scriptures so that's why I just wanted to give them the testimony that this, is, this has changed my life and a deeper study versus what any other church previously I've attended um you know, I could give too many denominational names, but I've come out of those churches and I've come into the truth of who Christ is and learning the scripture. That's what I wanted to share in the testimony. Okay, thanks, Ariella. I appreciate it. Um, I see some people, we've been going a really long time today, so I see some folks are leaving, cities had to leave, um, other ones have, have gone, so that's, um, that's all. Thank you for, for coming. Um, yeah, I, I think, Ariella, the, the Sure, Bible study is great, um, and as you know, I'm not against it, but, you know, some of the people with the strongest faith that I've met were illiterate people who couldn't actually uh, study, 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 because they couldn't read. Um, so, and I'm sure, historically, most Christians were illiterate, and yet it was the illiterate Christians who went to their deaths at the hands of the Romans and, and so on in the first century. 
second century later on. Um, so yeah, I, I'm just saying it sort of as a caveat, um, just as a, a, a just to sort of um, put it in its context that that Bible study of itself is not going to save anybody. You know, as the Lord said to the Jews, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but you will not come to me um, that you might have life. So you can become so maxed out on studying the Bible that you don't actually come to Jesus. Um, but uh, I know you're not saying that. And uh, you know, I, I appreciate um, your message of, of you know, get into the scriptures and um, and get out of you know all the different things you've passed through. Just this group and that group and the other group. No, it, it's it's a personal thing. Um, there's no doubt about that. Right. Has anybody else got anything they would like to say, or shall we um, have? Uh, I was going to say, shall we have coffee? Yes, uh, Duncan, if I may, a kind of a, a you might say, an end of life testimony, really, because um, well, you've, you've got another 20 years, Brian. Well, I have now, but I didn't have. Last year, um, my cardiologist called me in after a, a routine scan and said, you will be, and this is actually what he said, you will be dead by 2023. We are here to discuss what to do. And I said, that is very interesting. I said, I'm not at all worried about death. And anyway, it resulted in December in me having a, a new heart valve inserted, an aortic valve. And um, he said, I've got six to eight years, but if you're still fit enough, we can fit another new one inside that one. And I told this professor, Professor Prendergast at St. Tom, um, St. Thomas's in London. Um, it doesn't worry me about death. However, I have prayed to our Father that I've got a whole eternity in the kingdom. I would appreciate a few more years with my earthly family, my two little great granddaughters, and so on. But I'm not worried. In fact, I've told people I look forward to my death. It's a wonderful thing. Because in my experience, I'll be just, even if there's a little bit of pain involved, that will be forgotten in an instant. And I'll be waking up, wow, what is this? You know, I've got a glorious future. Death is nothing. Consequently, my daughter, late 50s, son, mid 50s, they're not worried about me dying. Because they know I'm not worried. So I welcome it. But not yet, please. No, you're a great example, Brian, of the best is ahead. I mean, you know, we, we're all a bit younger than you, I guess. But um, look, folks, you've just had a far more powerful testimony than what I can give you. I was there preaching to you, you know, the best is ahead, the best is ahead. And Brian has just showed us. I mean, how old are you, Brian? I'll be 85 next month if I live to that, God permitting. Well, well there you are. Someone coming up 85 can tell you that the best is definitely ahead. Well, what a wonderful testimony. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Yes, if I may now, it's uh, thrilled me up. Thank you for uh, Brian. Yes, God said, mm -hmm. man, we live now 120 years. It, it, <laughs> is, uh, it is, and I believe that, actually, because you God said, so it be, amen. But uh, thank you, Duncan, also for this message. It's made me so good to feel I'm so blessed. And actually, I remember it uh, a very long time. It's on my heart. Uh, I you know in the Bible, he said, uh, when full time of Gentiles will come in, uh, then will come that glorious days. We will be taken away. It will be with God. It's OK. But um, I think we should always pray uh, about Israel, Israel, Jews, eh? may they accept, may they say, may they hear gospel, and may they say, come Lord. And then I think it is my prayer is very selfish, because I want pastor to end all this, may, may Lord come and may everything change. Uh, 
maybe that is selfish, but for this reason, I don't know how, but I would like also to give my testimony because the God of Jews saved me who I was absolutely nothing. I was so even stupid, even just simple woman, so nothing. Okay? And he gave me a Bible and he saved me. And I always wanted to somehow put this on internet and Really, I, 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 you mean that a Jewish guy gave you the gave you the Bible? Is that what you said? The God of Israel, Israel, the God of ah, Israel. The God of Israel gave you the Bible. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Sorry, I, I am a little bit nervous, and so I can't mm, speak at all. But no, yeah, God of Israel gave me a Bible. I didn't want it. It's all, and so I. My often uh, my heart desire so that Israeli test Israelites Israelites uh, hear my story and so they become jealous like Paul wrote and it's my heart desire also. So. Because how. Hi, Aya, we, we sort of lost you, I think. What a shame you were in the middle of your testimony and we lost you. Uh, did your internet uh, black out or something? Yeah, it looks like it. And, you know, um, uh, there's a... Uh, are you yeah, back? it was... It is good. Uh, uh, amen. I, I have, I'm done speaking. I hope you something understood. I'm very nervous now. Well, 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 I, I, I can I agree with you. I, uh, we're, we're all looking for that day when Israel will definitely turn to the Lord Jesus. Yeah. Because, because that is the day when he is back in the earth and he is our salvation as well as Israel's. And not only Israel's salvation and our salvation, but the salvation really of the whole earth. He will put an end to wars and sufferings. The sword shall be built in, beat into the plowshare and the spear into the pruning hole. So he will be the salvation in that day uh, for all. And this is what we want. We want a, war, a world that reflects gratitude to God for what Jesus yes. brings us. So I don't think it's selfish. I know I might feel selfish. But yes, we want it, but we want it for a whole host of reasons. Yes, reasons. Thank you, Aya. That was lovely. Yeah, thank you, Aya. Yeah. Oh, really? No, Duncan, thank you, and thank you, Brian, and thank you, everybody, because you are such a blessing to me. Thank you all. To me too. But actually, I have very difficult to live. I can say I I am now hurting about everything, and I want to this all become to end. I can't hear anything bad. Uh, and my heart is broken. I, uh, how people act towards animals? How how those woods in Latvia? Every all is giving, uh, all is cutting, all is hurting. All world is very hurting. And when you see this, and uh, some some five years ago it was nothing. A year ago it was less hurtful, but uh, now it's time. I think it's it's horrible time. How has come? How people has become towards each other? How hurting? And it's hurting me. And I don't want this. And I pray to Lord, Lord, may make my heart soft. Okay, but towards all this. What is happening around may my heart is become more callous and don't feeling so much because it's very difficult to live because there is doggy, there is cat, cat, there is uh, horse, and they all people are hurting them because uh, I see it this way. Of course, not all, not everything, and not everybody, and not, not all, but so much hurt is how people are hurting in this world also, and. Uh, 
and this, uh, forgive me for this word, stupid COVID thing. Uh, so many people I know suicide. They are, they are in families. They are the 